Hey everyone. This week I got asked a really funny question and um, I think it was probably the way the question was asked more so than the question itself. But the question was, when do I use a business case? And so I thought in the spirit of trying to share some case studies about how this stuff looks in real organizations, I'd share you this story, this case study about a team that's trying to work out, when do we use a business case? So part of the reason it made me laugh is because the way the question came out was, I know you hate business cases, now, but I really, really, like, I just, I need to do it. I want to do it. I need you to be okay with it. I'm going to do it. And so I had a bit of a chuckle. Um, a, because you should never need my permission to do any of that, but we have some great conversations with the teams that I work with. And um, and so we got into it. I said, look, first first up, like, let me, let me explain myself. Let me justify myself. Let me give you some insight into why... Um, it is that I hate business cases and why I think you should never use a business case. Uh, so straight up, they're a tool that we've used with the best of intentions to try and put structure and, um, and I guess some certainty around projects to try and make sure that we have a vision for where we're headed, that we have some kind of document to keep us to account. And that all sounds perfectly reasonable, right? We want to know what is it we're trying to achieve? How much money, how much time, how much energy investment are we going to make in this? What do we think is going to happen as a result? And some kind of guiding document around this is what we're trying to do. So with the best intentions, we've used this tool. And unfortunately, uh, business cases in reality in most organizations, what it boils down to is that first up, there's, there's not usually too many options. The decisions are usually made, even with the best intentions of option A, B, C through D. Um, you know, we, we're, what we're doing is we're shutting down opportunities because we're trying to make um, certain a whole bunch of work that might over occur over a long period of time. And so by making those choices and those decisions up front, we're actually stifling some of those choices that might come further down the track. Uh, the other thing that happens is that we are trying in an effort to say, hey, here's what we think we're going to get as a result. What ends up happening is we get these benefits profiles that get loaded into business cases before we've even started any of the work. And then that's the thing that we hold the team accountable for. And it's part of what perpetuates that thing that happens in projects where at some point we stop going for that outcome that we're trying to achieve and we actually it flips into like this IT system and systems implementation and, and it becomes about getting the piece of IT kit in. And we forget all about why we started doing this in the first place. And then we get to the end of that project and there's a benefits profile and we've kind of got to match that, but it's three years down the track and project manager's finished, nobody cares, those benefits never get realized, they never get tracked. Um, and this is the reality for most organizations. So the third, the third reason I really dislike business cases is because they ultimately perpetuate a system around perfectionism and that escalates risk in our organizations because what we are trying to do with the business cases have a whole bunch of answers up front when frankly we don't have any idea what we're doing yet we don't know how that's going to wrap and how it's going to play in the business. We don't know how it's going to play out with customers. And yet we're trying to have all of the answers in this giant crystal ball before we start. So that's all of my baggage around business cases. That's why I don't encourage people to use them because they perpetuate and escalate risk through a process, particularly when you've got multi-year programs or aspirational goals or strategic capability that you're trying to build and it's a long-term investment. Uh, your benefits are usually fudged made to outweigh the costs um, when you start looking at MPV analysis and those sorts of things. It's, it's rigged to try and win the game and nobody actually cares about it once you're done anyway. And it's about knowing all those answers up front. It's about having an understanding of what it is that we're trying to build and that often just ends up in a very solution focused outcome as opposed to clear understanding of the problem statement, the vision and what we're trying to achieve and then working towards that. So those are all the reasons I don't like business cases. So I'll just put that out there on the table. Um, but the question came up, well, we're in the middle of this thing and we've got all these little bits and pieces going on and I'm trying to put on the table some level of strategic view and uh, some kind of view of what the heck that it is that we're doing and knowing that all of these little pieces that we're doing, A, we're losing uh, visibility of the big picture and B, I need to put like a chunk of money aside in an annual planning process to make sure that it's there when we get further down the track and we actually have to do some heavy lifting. Cool. So the first thing I'll say is that all of that stuff I've just said about business cases in no way devalues the problem that you're trying to solve. So that problem that you're feeling around, I want to have visibility of where it is that I'm going. 
I want to have an understanding of the level of time, energy, money investment that I'm going to make in this thing. And I want to have some kind of accountability that we're going to deliver something out the back end of it. Those are all valid problems. Choosing to use a business case or choosing not to use a business case does not invalidate those problems. It doesn't stop us from needing to solve those problems. So in the effort to offer up an alternative, I'll talk you through what I talked through with this team at a very high level. And um, we actually ended up recording five little five minute videos about this. But in essence, this was this is this is the model that I've used to run portfolios at scale. I'm talking hundreds of millions and billion dollar portfolios at scale without the use of business cases. So the first element that we talked about was this idea of an outcome. So in in some projects you might want to call in, in some project landscapes and some businesses you want, might want to call it a portfolio. Um, just more project language, but in, in essence, what we're looking for is an outcome, and these outcomes come in, in all shapes and sizes, but there's, there's roughly kind of two camps. There's your outcomes that are very well understood. Um, they are quite discreet. Uh, we have a clear understanding of what the problem is. We know what we're trying to achieve. Um, the example that I use here is, for example, taking a whole bunch of hardware out of a building, out of a data center, and moving it to another physical building. Like there's, There is a well understood uh, scope that we're trying to achieve. Uh, there's an end point on it. It's quite well defined. So that's that's kind of camp one. And then in camp two, you have those projects, programs, portfolios, outcomes, objectives that are way more aspirational. Uh, so these things tend to be open-ended. They tend not to have a clear pathway to what it is that you're trying to achieve. The outcome itself may be a little bit nebulous and not well understood. Um, so you've got that double complexity of we kind of know where we're going, but we also kind of don't know how to get there. So we might know the first few steps. Uh, it's the type of thing that although you might put aside some money in a financial year to uh, to head towards that outcome, you're probably going to want to repeat those uh, investments over subsequent years because it's this evolving nature. You don't just sort of put a chunk of money to, towards it and then you're done at a particular end point. It's something that you probably want to keep um, a longer term or a more constant stream of investment in as the thing continues to evolve. So I call those aspirational outcomes. They're kind of in camp two. So that, that first piece is really understanding like what is the problem we're trying to solve? Getting a clear definition of scope, if you want to call it that, uh, but a clear definition of the problem, the vision, what it is that we're trying to do, um, where it is that we're heading. So that's that's part one of, of, of what it is that we're trying to do. The second piece is around that visibility of, hey, we want to make a level of investment in this. And so um, absolutely there is room for a document, a one-pager, maybe there's a couple of pages that outline what that outcome is that we're looking for and some kind of level of investment. We're saying, look, really the question we're trying to answer with an executive is having understood what we're trying to achieve, having understood that outcome, how much time, energy, money, how much in resource are we prepared to put towards achieving that outcome? So rather than doing a bottom-up cost of what we think it's going to, going to cost and then negotiating for budget and back and forth and trying to make the benefits match and all of that jazz that goes on with the traditional business case, it's actually just about asking the question and saying, hey, we want to improve customer experience. We want to improve the engaging conversations that we have with our customers. How much money do you want to put to get towards that? Is it a million dollars? Is it $5 million? Is it only a couple hundred thousand? What feels right strategically? What is it we're trying to do and how much energy do we want to put towards this? That's the second piece. And then the third piece is really around how do we start to look at that outcome that we're trying to achieve, break it down into smaller chunks, break it down into independently valuable chunks of work, discrete capabilities you might call them. Uh, they might be software features. There's a lot of words for them, but how do we break down that outcome into discrete chunks that each deliver value independently that are each delivered all the way into market so that we can get those feedback loops going. And that gives us a whole bunch of things that we're able to then prioritize. We're able to sequence based on the feedback that we're getting from our customers, from our frontline staff, from our teams about what's working. And it gives us that flexibility to start, stop, pivot without committing to the greater whole. So remember when we normally do a business case and we, we go through that process, we're asking for that commitment for the whole lot up front. What we're trying to do with this alternative process is break it down into uh, a way of 
yes, capturing the vision that we're trying to achieve, yes, capturing the total level investment that we're asking for, but yes, also breaking that project down into discrete, independently valuable chunks that could each be delivered independently. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the finance team and say, you know, that million dollar outcome that we're looking for, we're not going to take all that money today. You're going to hold on to that money. What we need first is $50,000 to do this piece. We're going to go and work on that. And then once we finish that, we're going to come back. We're going to ask for the next chunk of money for the next piece. And this process allows us to limit our exposure for work in progress, both from a financial perspective, so keeping the finance team happy, but also from a work management perspective. It enables us to capitalize assets regularly because we're finishing things all the way through to production. We've actually banked the value from that asset for our customers. We've banked the benefits of that asset, whether it's cost reduction or revenue improvement or whatever else it is for our business. So it enables us to keep that constant cycle of limiting our work in progress, limiting our financial exposure, banking the benefits and the value as we go along, and it gives us the flexibility to learn from what's coming back so that we've got these feedback loops built in. And so whilst that entirety of that outcome, that aspirational goal, even the, the specific objective that we're trying to achieve, whilst that stays intact, we have this flexibility to choose our path towards that outcome as we learn more. And that creates the space for innovation. So that's kind of what I told this team. Uh, but what I did was I actually recorded a series of little five-minute videos. So I think there were five, I mean six, five-minute videos um, that were on each of these topics. So step one was about outcomes. Step two was about the model for how we wrap that through from strategy to outcome or portfolio to capability or um, feature and, and how that prioritization happens. Um, also took them through a rolling wave planning methodology that allows you to keep that planning cycle going, the funding request that goes with that so that we've got this tic-tac rhythm back and forth with finance around doing a piece of work, coming back with the benefits, asking for more money, doing the next piece of work within the encompassing whole. Um, and then the final piece was really about some fortnightly finances, which I think I've blogged about, I did a written blog a while ago now, um, the fortnightly finances process that we've used in projects that help you to get that visibility of what it is that's going on in your team on a two-weekly basis. So you're not waiting every uh, to the end of every month to get certainty around your financials. So put all of that into like this half-hour action-packed uh, video series. And uh, yeah, they're in the process of now going through what that looks like for their project. So this team chose not to go down the traditional business case path, um, which this little part of me that's like, yes, one more. Uh, but they did actually choose to uh, to start to put some stuff on paper, and they did that in a really specific way. So I thought I'd share that this with you this week because I know the case study thing's been resonating with people. So here's an organization that was going, how the heck do we get visibility of what's going on at the big picture so we can fit in with a financial planning process? How do we get visibility of all the different pieces of work that are going on so we can actually manage our work? How do we start to bring all of that together um, in a visual tool, in a paper document, whatever it looks like? How do we bring that together so we've got some cohesion? Uh, and in the absence of knowing any other tool, they'd, they'd gone for a business case. But actually, once we had the conversation, they've opted to go through this alternative process around, yep, we're going to set our outcomes, we're going to set our intentions, we're going to go through this rhythm of quarterly funding requests, quarterly planning sessions, making that work visible in this alternative way. And we're actually going to sidestep the, the business case process altogether because they want to encourage that innovation, they want to encourage that progress over perfection, they want to keep encouraging this way that they've been working which has been incredibly experimental with their suppliers um, and they want to keep that learning happening within the team. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you're super curious about the videos, uh, you can hit me up with a message. I might even pop a link in this uh, in this video description, but hit me up with a message and I will be more than happy to send you across a link where you can go and grab those videos for yourself and all the templates that go with them. So it's short, it's sharp, it's half hour training. It's like 100 miles an hour, firing bullets in all directions, but it will get you moving and it will get you into this process if you're looking for something uh, that's just a little aside from the way that you normally do things. And this will fit within your traditional projects, your traditional portfolio structures, um, but it will give you hopefully just a few ideas to start to spice things up a little bit. So I hope you enjoyed. Um, I hope wherever you are in the world today, you're having an awesome, awesome day. And I will see you again next week. Make sure you hit me up either with a message or click the link 
to go and get those videos and to go and get those templates so you can start implementing this for yourself too. Have an awesome day.